Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day, Jeremy Hutchings here. Welcome once again to Profitable Farmer. I'm sitting here, it's mid-January. It's about 16 degrees and I'm looking out the window and we've had about 60 mil of rain. Um, It feels like it's the start of a mid-June month, more so than mid-January. We'll take the rain. I hope things are really well where you are. So in this podcast, I want to talk to you about a discussion or a topic that I find fascinating. And it's not one that we learn about often, um, but the best business owners and the most influential people on the planet nail this piece. And it's the art of negotiation. I've been lucky enough, as I mentioned in prior webinars, to study with this guy, Marshall Thurber. Now, Marshall Thurber was a litigation lawyer for the US Army with an 87% success rate, one of the toughest legal litigation um, environments on the planet. And through applying a compelling set of principles, was able to play a very different game in a hostile setting. Um, Equally, Marshall Thurber um, taught himself to speed read once and reads four books every morning, always has and still does in his mid-70s. So I'm actually not sure where these principles have come from, Um, but for me, they are world-class, and when applied to important negotiations, um, can make such a compelling impact. And so when we think about negotiation... I want to frame up what that is first and foremost because it's not only with the bank or with suppliers or in complex marketing deals. Negotiation is quite simply, and the best definition of negotiation that I've heard, is simply influencing any relationship for the better improving any relationship. Now, that can be with your two-year-old daughter, my 12-year-old son. It can be with my parents. It can be with my bank. It can be with my team. But any relationship I want to impact for the better, then these generalised principles apply. Now, most of us grow up playing sport and most of us grow up through the schooling system and most of us exist in the normal economic and political framework of our society and so much of those constructs are based around the whole concept of win-lose. So for me to win a rugby game, I've got to beat the opposition. For me to win at golf and, you know, take home the prize, I've got to beat the other people that I'm playing golf with. At school, for me to get top of the class, I've got to beat the other 29 people in a class. When there is a shortage of physiotherapists getting into university, I've got to beat the other people with a better school mark wanting to get into that course. So I guess what I want to frame up here is that so much of our conditioning is around the premise of for me to win, others have to lose. Now, because that's our conditioning, The first mistake I think we make when it comes to negotiation is that we arrive into the conversation, into the negotiation and into the relationship with that mindset that for me to get what I want, the person 
that I am negotiating with needs to lose. And that is a huge mistake. It's our first and biggest mistake. Now, that's true on the sporting field, but it is not true in life. And certainly, it's not true in business. Now, there are people in business and people in life who will play win-lose in order to get what they want. Now, this is not me making them wrong. This is this the fact that they've bought into that conditioning perhaps more strongly than others. But if we think about it, if someone is playing win-lose and in the same way, if I'm swimming in the ocean and there are sharks in the water, there is absolutely no point me trying to turn that shark into a dolphin, giving it a hug, trying to talk to it, file back the teeth and turn it into a dolphin. It's just not going to happen. And so what Marshall Thurber quite firmly says, and it took me a while to get this, is that if there are sharks in the water, do not swim. Simply, if someone in your business sphere or in your life or in your environment is playing like a shark, playing win-lose, get out of the water. Don't swim. Choose a different pond to swim in. So that's the first point. Don't play win-lose. That's for sport. Business and negotiation in important relationships, business and life long-term, and not win-lose, they're win-win. So just be careful which waters you're swimming in and let's not swim with sharks. Now, to explain negotiations theory more deeply, I'm going to use a whole lot of metaphors. If you've got a pen and paper and you can write these down, as I go through the metaphors, just capture them. Because whenever I am trying to influence a relationship for the better now, I fall back to these metaphors as I prepare for any negotiation and that will make sense as we track. And so write these down as we go through. The first one that I want to talk about is if you were to build a house in a muddy swamp, which one would win? The swamp wins every time, right? And so if we want to set down the foundations for a new or an improved relationship, the first thing that we have to do is drain the swamp. And so in a negotiation, if you think about it with your father or with your brother or with your accountant or whoever, your stock agent, the first question that I always ask is, is there a need to drain the swamp? Is there shit that's gone down in the previous two months, two years, 20 years that is negatively impacting the potential for a stronger relationship moving forward? And if there is, then the first thing that we need to do is take ownership of that, not make the swamp wrong, just accept that that has happened and take responsibility for draining the swamp. Now, that can be a letter. It can be a conversation, and that is all that the first conversation is about well before anything else to do with the, the negotiation actually takes shape. It is simply, hey, three years ago, this happened. I've never apologised, but I actually think we need to have a chat about that. Um, work it out, sort it out, so that we can 
set down a basis for a better working relationship moving forward. Now, draining the swamp can take a bit of time, but it's important to do it until both parties feel complete. And coming back to the metaphor, there is no point setting down the foundations for a new home in a muddy swamp. So drain that swamp completely. Then let there be time and space and then we can move into the construct of improving a relationship through a genuine win-win mindset. So the next point is to commit that you want a win-win outcome. So there are negotiations where you kind of do want them to be win-lose. If I'm buying a dishwasher, I want the best price, you know? So I will negotiate hard, a bit like I'm playing rugby. But if it is a succession negotiation or a family or a long-term business partner related negotiation, then I've got to commit to a win-win. There is absolutely no point going into a succession relationship with a win-lose mindset. For me, and in my experience of this consulting to farmers over the last 20 years, it just doesn't go well. So you've got to commit that I want to get what I want and I want for them to get what they want. And I'm going to come back to that later on, but that can be hard to achieve. It takes lots of communication and importantly, it takes lots of lateral thinking. And I'm going to come back to that. Achieving a genuine win-win outcome that absolutely feels win-win for all parties takes, it's not obvious and it's not quick. The quick solutions are win-lose normally, I reckon. You've got to think really critically and think really laterally and stay in it for quite a while in order to expand the pie enough, if you like, to get a win-win outcome. But the first thing that you need to do before you go into a negotiation, in my experience, is to commit that this is a win-win. Now, the next metaphor that I want to talk about is simply this. If I have a dog and I raise my hand and step forward to attack the dog, who has all the power? At that point, I do. I'm the attacker. It's the victim. Now, if the dog rolls over onto its back, who has all the power? Instantly in that moment, the power sits with the dog because there is absolutely no way that I am going to flog a dog on its back. And so with that metaphor in mind and looking back into negotiation, is there a need to roll over is the next question I ask. An apology is not something that comes naturally, perhaps especially to blokes, as they go into a full-on and heated negotiation because we think it's a sign of weakness. It's actually genius. And so when I'm going into negotiations, I find myself now actively looking to manufacture a reason to roll over because it actually brings the power in that situation back to me. And that is okay in my experience if I want a win-win outcome. And so, again, it's, hey, before we start this conversation, I'd just like to apologise for being late. I'd like to apologise for that email last week arriving to you a little later than I promised. I want to apologise that we haven't spoken for four years. 
Um, I'm deeply regretful of that. No matter how big the apology, being brave enough and vulnerable enough, and what I'm learning is that vulnerability is becoming a key ingredient in leadership, it's equally the case in win-win negotiations. And so can you or is there the need to roll over? Remembering that doing that brings power back to you um, where it might be with the other party. Really important. And again, I think it's a useful metaphor to think about that dog um, rolling over when being attacked. So the next part of this links back to that win-win construct is that naturally when we think about this whole thing called win-win, and we've all heard a whole lot about it, I'm sure, is the first way that we think about that naturally is that for me to get what I want, they need to get what they want. We put ourselves first. I get what I want and then they get what they want. I want to encourage you to think about how you might flip that round. And so what I like to do in preparing for a negotiation is to stop and think, what is it that this other party want most deeply and how can I give them that? And then in the giving of that, how can I get what I want? It's a selfless approach to negotiation. It's a giving approach. And it's a putting ourselves second rather than putting ourselves first approach, which is counterintuitive. A lot of this stuff is counterintuitive. But if they get a sense that that's where you're coming from, the whole energy and the whole dynamic of the negotiation can change. And once that happens, everything opens up and you're engaged with them, shoulder to shoulder, beside them, problem solving this for both parties, which is a way better dynamic than sitting opposite them, you trying to get what you want and them trying to get what they want. It's a great leadership position to take in negotiation to flip it around by focusing first on how can I give them what they want and then so that I can get what I want. Counterintuitive but really important and really powerful. Okay. Part of that process can be you speaking to them and asking them deeply what they want. Now, a mentor of mine whose name is Keith Cunningham, it's been said that this guy is the rich dad in Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He's an amazing business mind out of Texas and a wonderful gentleman. He speaks to this next concept perfectly. And so one option you have if you are coming at improving a relationship through negotiation so that you get a better win-win outcome is to get the other person gotten, get them gotten. So as part of exploring what they want, you can sit with them having drained the swamp having committed to a win-win outcome, having rolled over, having put them first instead of you in your thinking around win-win, the next thing you can do is sit with them and deeply understand what they want. Now, the way that I think about this is if you were going on a first date, blokes, if you sit at that table and talk only about yourself at that first date, do you get a second date? The obvious answer is absolutely not. 
But if you sit at that table at that first date with that beautiful lady or gentleman and you show deep interest in them and if 90% of the conversation is you asking them questions about what they want or about their life, you will get a second date every time. And so getting someone gotten can be a really important step in opening up for a win-win and an improved relationship. And so Marshall, oh, sorry, Keith Cunningham tells this story about how um, he was sitting in his fancy office as a really successful businessman and this sales rep busted her way into his office and insisted on a meeting. And after a few minutes, Keith interrupted her and said, hey, would you be interested in having dinner with me? And she was quite taken aback, but she said yes. And he arrived to that dinner with about 10 pieces of blank paper and a pen. And for the whole of that first date, he asked her one question and it was, what do you want? Okay, great. And then what do you want? And if I could give you that, then what do you want? And what else? And what else? And what else? And for hours, he interrogated her about what she wanted in her life. And at the end of that first date, he turned around to Sandy and said, so if I can give you all of that, will you marry me? Now, they've been married for over 15 years since. But it's a really interesting play from a negotiation standpoint that deeply understanding what they want and then you thinking about how they can get what they want so that you can is getting them gotten. Now, from a negotiation standpoint, most of us don't do that. We're deeply clear on what we, we want and we're clear on what we would be willing to concede in order to get a, an outcome. But normally that doesn't deliver a deep and effective long-term win-win outcome. So getting someone gotten is the next piece in this puzzle. So for the next metaphor, I want you to picture a little dinghy boat, one of those little tubs. Now imagine it was sitting idle in the water, no motor on, just sitting in the water, and two people are sitting on the edge of that dinghy on either side facing each other. And picture a rope that goes from one of them through a little ball ring or a little shackle at the bottom of the boat where your feet are up to the other person. And they're both holding the ends of the rope. This is a negotiation. Now, both of them are pulling intently on that rope, trying to win the negotiation. Now, the question that I have for you, if you're one of them and I'm the other, and we're both sitting on the edge of the dinghy, facing each other, pulling on this rope, the question that I've got is how do you stay dry? If we're in a negotiation, neither of us want to get wet. So if we're pulling out, how do I stay dry? I can let go of the rope and we both get wet. That's a lose-lose outcome. The only way, and this is a key point, that I can stay dry is to lean in. If I lean in, then you or the person that I'm negotiating with has the decision, split decision to make as to whether they keep leaning out or whether they lean in. But they don't want to get wet either, so they will lean in. So it's a wonderful metaphor, again, from a negotiation standpoint. And it seems a little bit like I'm talking in riddles, but I do feel like these metaphors are incredibly powerful. 
that if I lean into the negotiation and lean into the other person, then they will lean in as well. Again, a far better outcome can be achieved that way. So I'm just going to go back over this stuff briefly. Firstly, don't swim with sharks. Be a dolphin, not a shark. Play win-win, not win-lose. When you play win-win, focus first on what the other person wants and how you can give them that, and then what you want, second. Thirdly, seek to drain the swamp completely so that you can set the foundations for a new and lasting long-term relationship. Next, ask the question, is there a need to roll over? Next in doing that is how might I get them gotten so that I deeply show them that I am interested in them getting the exact outcome that they want? And then the boat metaphor, lean in. And in so doing, you're taking a leadership position in this conversation, the outcome of which is it is most likely that they too will lean in. All of that sets a wonderful context for a stronger relationship or the stronger likelihood of a better outcome than not doing those things. So now the basis is set. So what I want to talk about is that if you do value your accountant and you genuinely want for there to be a lasting and long-term relationship, but their fees are too high, this stuff works. If you genuinely do want to stay with the bank that you've got rather than go to another one and you respect the bank manager you've got but you want better interest rates, this stuff works. If there's tension in your family from a succession or from a day-to-day -day functioning perspective and you want for the relationships to be stronger or you want there to be a better basis for succession to unfold, this stuff works. And equally, if my five-year-old isn't behaving the way that I want them to, this stuff works. Making them wrong playing win-lose and not doing this stuff isn't it. So now the foundations are set for a strong way forward. Then the next step is not to focus on the past, which is what a lot of people do. We try and rehash history, which is destructive to fostering a win-win partnership or influencing a relationship for the better into the future. The two next pieces in this puzzle, the first is brightness of the future and the next is darkness of the future. And it's really important going into any negotiation to be really clear on these two things. Tony Robbins talks about pleasure and pain are the two motivators or the two drivers for all of us. And so we forget about the present next in this negotiation and we want to paint a really bright image of what the future can look like for them and for us, it's really important to do both as part of inspiring or influencing a stronger outcome. If we can get this succession right, then our off-farm siblings or family members can achieve what they want and a really healthy basis for a retirement or school fees or whatever it is, you, mum and dad, can retire strongly 
and comfortably without the stress and pressure of the farm. We can keep this farm in our family, reduce debt and continue to expand. Now, what I want for you is X. What I want for us is Y. But 10 or 20 years from now, if we get this right, this is how it can look. I want Christmas 10, 15, 20 years from now to be all of us still together, cherishing those moments with each other and with our grandkids or your grandkids or whatever it is, brightness of the future. Really important, people want to move towards pleasure and they want to move away from pain. And so you've got to be able to articulate brightness of the future. Equally, darkness of the future. Most people don't want to go into darkness of the future in a negotiation, but it is so important. Moving away from pain is normally a bigger motivator than brightness, moving towards pleasure. And so it is equally important to paint darkness of the future in order to create urgency and to get an outcome. If this doesn't work out, then we're going to change banks. Um, you're going to lose this. We're going to have to go through this. It could get messy. Um, no one wants that. Um, no one wins. So darkness of the future is also a valid tool to use as part of pursuing win-win outcomes. It needs to come later in the conversation after those foundations have been set, but it's really important going into a negotiation that you've taken time to reflect and even write down what can brightness look like for them? What can brightness look like for us? How do I amplify that in how I communicate? Then importantly, what does bright darkness of the future look like for them? And what does darkness of the future look like for us? And how do I paint that picture with intensity through my communication? I was watching the TV series Bull the other day. For some reason, I'm fascinated by that TV series. And there was a really interesting um, legal battle in play where a white couple had had um, IVF and I think the sperm was mixed up such that they had an African-American child and five years into that child's upbringing, the natural father put in a um, claim to have his son, have custody of his son and it was so interesting and the natural father and his wife wanted full custody and the um, IVF parents wanted full custody. And so these two couples are in the boat pulling on the rope, both wanting to stay dry, both wanting to get what they want. And I love watching this movie and just reflecting on these principles and watching how the negotiation or the, the legal battle plays out. To my next point, and I said this before, that win-win solutions aren't easy. And there's a lot of time and there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of critical thinking and there's a lot of lateral thought often that's needed so that you can get a win-win outcome. But after all of what I've spoken about has been done and brightness and darkness have been painted, then 
it's really important to seek to expand the pie. And this is a hard bit. This is the intellectual bit that takes a lot of time. And so coming back to that Bull TV series, what Bull did is he had a lateral thought and he went back to both of these couples and said that he had an idea that can see the IVF parents get what they want and the natural parents of this young boy get what they want. And the lateral thought that expanded the pie and offered a lateral and different solution was that another egg be provided from the IVF parents to the natural parents so that another child could be born so that both parents had the opportunity to have full custody of a child through this battle. Now, initially, everyone rejected that thought process. Both couples and even the judge and jury all rejected that being an appropriate alternative or a potential win-win solution. <clears throat> but when you think about it, it's perfect. If you take now out of the equation in a negotiation and you take yourself forward five years in that negotiation, then that suggestion can arrive both families to an incredible reality five years from now. And the way that series ended was that both families wanted the other family in the lives of both children and both families offered to support financially the education for both children. Win-win. By expanding the pie, by thinking laterally and also by taking the now out of the equation and thinking about how how can we might not be able to achieve a win-win outcome now but if we think forward five or ten years what could the future solution be that can arrive us to a win-win over time now i use that example from that bull series intently because I think it's relevant in a succession context. Succession when I'm the on-farm son and I've got an off-farm sister and an, on, an off-farm brother, you know, we could talk about succession like we're trying to cut up an apple pie, that we don't want a third, a third, a third, that that's not viable for me, that even me getting 50% and them getting a quarter each isn't it. But if that's the thought process on how we get succession done now, no one necessarily wins. But if you think forward five or ten years and you apply these principles and you stay in the conversation and problem solve together with a view that everyone wins and that others win even before I do, then it could be that the off-farm children get a million dollars each and that I get the farm, but invested well in 20 years, the off-farm interest can grow at 12% and the on-farm interest can grow at 4% or whatever it is so that it is equitable and fair in the future. So I guess well, I'm not suggesting that is the solution in succession. Please don't quote that specific example but thinking into the future and taking the pressure off now can be a really important component to affecting lasting long-term win-win outcomes that sustain and improve relationships so 
a fair bit in all this. Couple more points. One is frequency of interaction. If we have a meeting and then to try and get an outcome with a supplier or with an accountant or with our bank or in succession, and then nothing happens for six months, there's no frequency of interaction, then that negotiation will probably fail or revert back to win-lose. Frequency of interaction is just so important. And so if you want for a negotiation to be effective, regular, organised, frequent, weekly, twice weekly, meetings, emails, phone calls, Zoom meetings, whatever it is, are critical. If you can keep up a high frequency of interaction and dialogue, the increased frequency is so important in a good outcome getting done from a negotiation standpoint. So the next question is how can I propose or get in place frequent interactions so that we give ourselves the best chance of moving efficiently to a constructive outcome. A meeting every six months isn't going to cut it. Twice a week might not be enough. And so lastly, in all of this, I've used a whole host of metaphors. So I want to make the point, as I have used them today, that metaphors have changed the course of history. Some of our greatest leaders in history have used a verbal or a visual metaphor and in so doing landed well and at the appropriate time have changed the course of history. I think of Mandela wearing the number six jersey, PNR's journey jersey in the World Cup. Now, no words were spoken, but symbolically, that changed a nation. Think about Martin Luther King, I had a dream. Metaphors landed well in a negotiation can change the game. And so I was in a negotiation a few years ago with an accounting firm and I was seeking to merge my business with that accounting firm. And there were multiple directors on their side of the negotiation and there was me on my side. And it wasn't happening. Frequency of interaction wasn't in place um, and the whole thing had stalled. Now, I thought about this whole thing. What metaphor can I land that could get this done? Because we're all in for this. We all want it. It's just, it's just not happening. And so I made a phone call to the managing director of that accounting firm and I said, mate, I'm standing up front. The congregation is getting edgy. I'm getting a bit hot under the collar. When are we getting married? Now that negotiation completed within 72 hours. For months, I'd been trying to influence it to get it done, to get the details sorted. That metaphor, that getting married metaphor, that image that I painted in his mind, changed the whole negotiation. Done within 72 hours. And so what metaphor might I use that can change the conversation, change the energy, change the dynamic in order to get a negotiation moving or to get it done. So I'm just going to recap. 
because there's a fair bit in this. Firstly, if there are sharks in the water, if there are sharks in your business relationship or business environment, get out of the water and find a different pond to swim in. Don't swim with sharks. Don't swim with people who play win-lose. And certainly don't try and change them into a dolphin. Then commit that you are going to play win-win in this negotiation. And in so doing, instead of putting yourself first, think first, how can I help the other person win? And in so doing, then get what I want. If you can do that and come at a negotiation from that mindset, then everything can change. Next question, is there a swamp to drain? Is there stuff muddying the waters that keep us from setting down the foundations for a strong relationship into the future? Next, is there a need for me to roll over? The dog being attacked, do I need to roll over and apologise to set the foundations for a stronger way forward. Next, in finding out what they want, do or how can I get them gotten? Like that first date and being deeply interested in the other party, how do I get them gotten? Next, the boat metaphor of two people sitting on the edge of that dinghy pulling on the rope lean in rather than lean out and in so doing you're giving everyone the chance to stay dry then what is brightness of the future for me and what is brightness of the future for them if we get this right what is darkness of the future for me and what is darkness of the future for them if we don't get this right, then how do we introduce frequency of interaction so that we can keep momentum and keep the dialogue going, written, verbal and other, to give this negotiation the best chance of keeping momentum? The next piece is timing. Do we need to let go of getting a win-win outcome now and instead focus on getting a win-win outcome for both parties into the future. And that was my bull series example of the IVF family and the natural family. The next part to that is how can we think critically and laterally so that we can expand the pie? Let's have another child so that there are two children and two families. And then let's have it that both families love both children. Full custody for everyone. How do we expand the pie so that everyone can win? And then lastly, is there a metaphor that I can use that can change the energy, change the focus, and shift the dynamic of this negotiation for the better. So there is some of what I've learned from Marshall Thurber around the art and the science of negotiation and influencing relationships for the better. And, guys, it is every relationship, from my 2-year-old to my 92-year-old family member and every business relationship therein. But to close this out, just please remember that the game of business and the game of life is not based on the same rules as the game of sport or the game of school, where for me to win someone else must lose. That isn't it. 
And so for those listening, if you reflect deeply on this and you realise that you've been playing win-lose, your default mindset, as it was for mine, is that for me to win that others must lose, that's a scarcity mindset. That's presuming that there's not enough to go around. An abundance mindset is the opposite. And in business and life, that construct of for me to win, someone else must lose, is not it. That's true in sport only. And it's, you know, it's, it's part of the construct that we've come up with. But we've got to let that go and appreciate that win-win can happen and does happen all the time. And success in business and life can only happen where we are fostering win-win rather than win-lose relationships. So, guys, I hope that's useful. Again, through Marshall Thurber, I've learned how to apply these principles to multi-million dollar negotiations as equally to negotiations with my children on a daily basis. I hope they're useful for you. I have created a negotiations template that allows people to work through what I've been through today in preparing on paper for a negotiation in advance. And so I'm happy to share that negotiations template with you. If you'd like it, either email us at support at farmownersacademy.com or jump on to our Profitable Farmer Facebook page and make a request for it. And absolutely, I'm happy to share it there. So, guys, I hope this is helpful for you. I've really enjoyed speaking to this. It's a topic that I'm very passionate about and that I think can have a real impact in helping farm business owners improve in business, but also farming families improve together in how we, um, how aligned we are and even how well succession can happen over time. So thanks for listening. Um, some really exciting interviews coming up over the next few sessions and few episodes. Um, really looking forward to some more in-depth interviews. So um, keep tracking with me. Thanks for your support and your interest in Profitable Farmer. All the best as this season plays out. Take care. All the best in negotiations and bye for now.